all-time favorite uh, right. patient. Oh, it's probably my all-time favorite patient group. And I really want to compliment Connie and the team. You know, the, I, I just learned about the article myself, but I mean, this is the example of how things are done right. And uh, it, it just, it, it's, it's amazing the progress they've made. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm really excited. Um, you know, I, we had talked a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about some surgical advances and, and sort of the pediatric world, because I, I think that um, I'm biased, but uh, as a pediatric neurosurgeon, I really feel there's an incredible importance in helping and understanding kids. Uh, so I am going to talk a little bit about how kids are different than grownups uh, in cavernomas and cavernous malformations, and then talk about some of the surgical advances um, the big thing I want to do is have this be a conversation, and I would love to get questions and talk. I realize I only have eight hours to speak to you tonight. You're probably all strapped in. You got your popcorn. So uh, I'll start the slides up, and, and we'll get going here. So um, neurosurgery is easy. Making the computers work is the hardest. But let's see if I can get this to work. Um, <clears throat> So again, it's a real pleasure to speak tonight about pediatric uh, cavernous malformations and surgical advances. Um, I want to start out, you know, I, I know the group is incredibly smart and well-versed, but, but just to set the stage, you know, a little bit of, of what we've been learning together about what cavernous malformations are, um, you know, speaking very concretely, because as a surgeon, I'm a very concrete person, you know, why are they a problem? And I think particularly for kids, it's worth highlighting the natural history and some of the surgical selection indications, you know, why do you do surgery? And it's my kid, you know, why, why are you doing this? And, and to explain that a little bit better. Um, the big challenges I think that, that I face as a surgeon, many of us face, um, you know, are who do you treat? Uh, not every cavernous malformation necessarily needs to be treated. Some do. So how do you know? Um, how can we do better surgical techniques? You know, where, where can we as surgeons if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, we're not going to advance. And, and I think that's important. And then lastly, you know, speaking to what Connie has done with the, with the group as a whole, you know, what novel treatments are on the horizon that I hope someday will put me out of business. Uh, and, and so I don't want to speak too much about that, but I, I do think that's a, that's a really important thing. And I'm, I'm so proud of the group for doing that. So again, most of you have known this, and, and I will say just as a spoiler alert, um, I will have a couple of yucky slides with operative pictures. And if people are not excited to seeing that, I'll try to give you a little heads up. Um, there's nothing too, too gross, but I, I, I do think it's important to understand. And I just want to, you know, as a surgeon, that's part of what we do. I think it's important to understand what's there, but, but if folks are not excited, I will try to give you a little warning so you can look away or blank your screen or whatever beforehand. Um, so, you know, cavernous malformations, as you know, they, they live inside the brain itself, which is why surgery sometimes is so challenging, or in the spinal cord. Uh, you know, even though I've been doing this for decades, uh, this idea of a mulberry, I, I knew what a cavernous malformation looked like, but I didn't know what a mulberry looked like. And people talk about it, but there are these little tiny bubbles that exist inside here. And as a surgeon, these are the things that can bleed sometimes and irritate the surrounding brain tissue and spinal cord tissue. And it stains it. You see this little yellowish area. This is like the tattoo. Uh, of the old blood. And, and this is what it looks like physically. And when you see an MRI, and maybe for those of you that have had MRI reports for yourself or your family members, and you say, what is hemosiderin? What's this spy talk? Um, it, this blackish stuff that you see on the MRI around the cavernous malformation is when these little bubbles pop and they leak a little bit of blood in the surrounding tissue and you get this yellowish stain here like rust, if you will, uh, but it's like a tattoo. So, so this is what they look like. Uh, and this is why sometimes they're sort of challenging. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit in the weeds here as a doc. If I, if I wasn't a you know, nerdy Harvard professor, I guess I wouldn't be doing this, but um, part of this is to learn. And if it's helpful, great. If it's not, then you've got some big words to throw around at a cocktail party or something. Um, but you know, these are slow flow vascular malformations, meaning they're not with big arteries, so they don't go real fast. Depending who you read, they're, they're pretty common. They, they affect you know, uh, anywhere from you know, one in, uh, you know, 200 to one in a thousand people. They, they lack this sort of stickiness between cells. So these little blood vessels, they don't have good Velcro to hold on to one another. And as a result, that's why they, they stretch and create those little bubbles I showed you, this endothelial cell, a blood vessel cell. And that's why they can sort of pop and leak sometimes or they stretch. And that's the underlying some of the genetic problems that causes these not to stick together so well. That's why they're, they're leaky. Um, 
A really interesting thing that has been done in large part through work with the Angioma Alliance has been this understanding of the microbiome and you know gut bacteria. You know, you are what you eat. Uh, in which case, I'm mostly Twinkies and Diet Coke, I guess. Uh, but this gram-negative bacteria, it's a kind of germ that everybody has in their gut. But sometimes some of these bacteria can make uh, a certain chemical that is circulated through the bloodstream. And it turns out that this chemical from bacteria may in fact interact with these blood vessel cells and cavernous malformations and affect how leaky they are. And this is a fairly recent discovery past few years, and it really fundamentally changes how we understand how these things work. So, um, you know, I, I know uh, Connie has some thoughts about diet. I agree with what she says, and it, it's really a, a very interesting way to learn about things that we can control. Um, most of these cavernous malformations are one-time lesions, meaning you've got one and they're not elsewhere in the body, but uh, a number of them will be what we call familial, meaning they're in the genetics and they may run in families. And that's that great article in the Atlantic that you uh, just heard about. So, um, you know, these are usually three different genes, meaning there's sort of three specific parts of the, of the genetic instructions that are repeatedly have sort of bad copies of themselves that, that cause these mistakes and stickiness to happen. Um, the names for these things, if you again, you know, they're called CCM, you know, cerebral cavernous malformation, uh, CCM one, two, and three. There weren't very original scientists, I guess, when they put the names together. Uh, you may have seen the fancier names if you see reports, CRIT one, malcaverin, or PDCD10, um, but, but essentially um, all of them are, we believe somehow in, involved with how cells either move around or stick together. And the common theme is that these little bubbles form because blood vessels, capillaries can't stick together the way that they should. Um, why are they a problem? Well, here's an example in the spinal cord from that picture I showed you earlier. It was a little tiny dot, you see. So this is the spinal cord coming down, the belly button's here, the back is here. If you look at a cross section, you can barely see the little dot there. And yet over time, these can bleed. And, and for those of you that have patients or yourself that, that have had these, you know that these can sort of flare up and become problems. And, and that's why you have to operate on them sometimes. So now that we know what they are, what do we do about them? And, you know, I'm going to be obviously biased towards the surgery side, but the real thing that's important, and again, I want to compliment the Angioma Alliance, we really need evidence. And the American Heart Association guidelines, the American Stroke Association guidelines has built on a lot of the work that has been sponsored or promoted by the Angioma Alliance to create these evidence-based national guidelines. And it's really um, helped us a lot to, to be smarter as surgeons, as doctors, uh, to, to know who to treat when to treat and how to treat them. So I'm going to share a little bit of that data with you tonight. Um, this is one of our papers from a few years ago, looking specifically in kids, different than adults, what happens if you just watch them? And, you know, one big question is, Doc, how the heck do you know you got a cavernous malformation? And in kids, um, you know, a, a large number of them uh, are going to be incidental. They just found because little Susie or little Timmy falls and hits his or her head and they get a scan. Um, seizures are probably one of the most, uh, you know, common presentations for kids. Um, again, about a third of the kids will present with a seizure. Um, and that's because the blood irritates the brain and the brain, you know, reacts and has a seizure. And then hemorrhage, either with a seizure or with a headache or any sort of symptoms, depending what part of the brain is affected. These these are the reason that these things are found. Um, the vast majority of them, three quarters or more, are found in the top part of the head, what's called the supratentorial region, if you want to impress people. Uh, and then there are other places lower in the brain called the brain stem and the back of the brain called the cerebellum or the deep parts of the brain called the thalamus and basal ganglia. But the vast majority are up here and that's largely because that's the biggest part of the brain. There's just more brain, so it's more likely it's going to be there. Um, how often do we see new ones? Well, again, in kids, um, you know, basically what you'll see is that uh, the annual rate of sort of getting new cavernous malformations is very, very low, uh, you know, somewhere in the order of about one per 200 or so. So once you've got one that's there, but new ones in the non-familial group are, are pretty rare to see. So hopefully just if you have one, that's all you got to deal with. Um, a big question I get a lot from everybody is, hey doc, I've got one of these things, maybe you haven't taken it out, you know, what makes them bleed? Should I, you know, wrap up my, my kid in bubble wrap and hide them under a mattress forever so they don't play? And the answer is, 
know, um, a nice study by a group out in San Francisco has shown that you can pretty much do anything. And, and uh, you know, what I tell my patients is, um, you know, high impact repetitive sports, uh, tackle football, boxing, they're probably not good whether or not you have a cavernous malformation, but I do restrict my patients from that. Otherwise, there's not a whole lot that really causes these to bleed. If for some reason the child has to be on some high blood thinning medication, we get a little nervous about that. But I hope that this is reassuring, having looked at 2.3 million children, not all with cavernomas, but with other blood vessel issues, that the likelihood of bleeding from regular activity, going to physical education, gym at school, playing sports is probably very low. So this is probably one of the more important takeaway slides from today. And, and I hope it puts people's mind at ease a little bit for their kids. Um, how often do they bleed? Um, incidentally, again, very low, about 0.5% per year. So, you know, it happens. It's enough to be concerned about over the life of a child. And that's why we get nervous about these and sometimes recommend treating them. Um, but where they're really a problem is if they've bled already, they tend to cluster a little bit and bleed in a row. So this is why we do get a little more nervous if we see people that are symptomatic or present with bleeding as opposed to somebody we just find incidentally. Uh, and, and you can see here, this is work that is similar to what's seen in adults, but in kids, it's even a little bit more uh, aggressive in terms of once they've had a few repeated bleeds. And this is another way that kids are a little bit different than grownups. Um, the nice thing, if it is a nice thing, is that this bleeding rate usually is the highest in the first few years after you present with a bleed. What does that mean? Well, we usually follow in the guidelines now, this is one of the ways the research has helped, is we get pictures typically once a year for five years. Why do we do that? Well, in part, because if there's going to be a problem, we usually see it in the first couple of years. And as you can see from this graph, things thankfully usually quiet down with time. So this is a really good reason why we do our follow-ups the way that we do, because it's not just arbitrary, it's based on data to suggest that hopefully we're doing the right thing and we, we don't want to do too many scans, but we don't want to skip scans if we can find problems early on. So that's sort of that the natural history is. What about specific locations in the head? Um, you know, people ask, hey doc, you know, where do you find these things? Well, one of the sort of breakdowns here, as I mentioned earlier, is that while most of them are up on the surface, this area called the basal ganglia, while it's pretty rare, again, about 5% or so, when they're there, people get very nervous about them. And I'll talk later about how we've now developed some treatments for these. Um, but, but this is sort of deep in the brain. You can see a picture of it here. And I bring it up only because there seems to be a disproportionate number of questions. And when I gave a similar talk to this last year, I got a lot of emails about these after. So I've added this in here. But, but the takeaway, if anybody out there has questions about basal ganglia cavernomas, usually if it's big or causing symptoms, we'll take it out. If there's recurrent bleeding, we'll take it out. But if it's small or it's not bleeding, usually we leave it alone. And we have good data to show from our paper and others that many times these can sit kind of quietly and people can go about their normal lives. So again, a rare, sort of a rare bird, uh, but it's generated a lot of uh, questions and I've modified this hopefully to answer that, that from what I've heard from folks. Um, other locations of the super tentorial ones, this is the most common. This is your Chevy, your Ford, you know, whatever your most common type of car is. This is what most folks see. And we looked at this. Um, the important thing people note is that, you know, almost, uh, you know, commonly one of the most common questions is, hey, doc, my, me or my child presented with seizures, um, you know, if you take out my cavernoma, and will that fix my seizures? And the bottom line is about 96% of the time, um, this will cause people to become seizure free if you can get the whole cavernoma out. So this is a really good indication that surgery helps not just to get rid of the risk of bleeding, but also to help with surgery. And our group here at least has been very good about weaning people off medicines over time. So I think this is one of the big reasons to talk about surgery in kids because it has a good cure rate and it prevents this thing called kindling where the brain, and you're not buying books from Amazon, but the brain keeps sort of making these um, uh, little uh, irritated things that can continue if it's left for too long. So this is a good example of how surgery can really help in kids. Um, in terms of uh, overall, again, uh, even for those that aren't completely cured from seizure, there's a very high rate of reducing the seizure frequency, even in very severe cases. So uh, again, just a little push that even in bad cases, surgical resection can sometimes help. Bottom line, like our friends in Nike say, if you have the right indications, and I don't want to be cavalier, 
but surgery can really help many times in cavernomas in kids. So I, I wanna be very specific about who we do it in, but once there's a right decision, I think it can really help people. That said, we wouldn't be doing our job and this great group wouldn't exist if we weren't always asking the question, how can we do better? What is it, you know, with all these numbers you showed, Ed, you know, what they are, why they're here, why they're a problem, how you fix, why kids are different. We, we want to do better. And, and that's why I hope everyone's here tonight. Um, this is something, you know, the question we ask pretty much every day is how can we advance the care of patients with cavernous malformations? And this is where they keep me inside the box. <laughs> I'm not allowed to think outside the box too often. This is my one obligatory cartoon in the talk. Uh, but, but I think this is important. And, and, you know, even in surgery, which is in some ways a very primitive part of medicine, especially when you hear what the Angioma Alliance and the groups have been doing in the science world, I still think there's ways to advance. And the big thing with surgery really, particularly for kids is it's like driving. You wanna get where you wanna go and you wanna get there safely. So how do you do that? And I'll show some examples. This is one of our ways and I'll go from sort of more primitive to more advanced. But you know, one way is simply thinking about different ways to get through parts of the brain safely. And this was a paper where we say, you know, a lot of people say the brain stem, this really high priced real estate, it's a hard place to get to. And yet with a little bit of thinking, and now there's gonna be a gross picture coming. So mind your eyes if this bothers you. Um, but can we get to where we need to go here? And what we found is a different route. This is the gross picture of going not through the brain, but in a natural corridor around the edge of the brain to get to the brain stem. And this is now something we do routinely in kids that never really could have been done before. And this brainstem resection really helps us to treat cavernomas that couldn't be treated before. Um, and so this is one way just thinking outside of the box. Another way is to say, well, how can you be less invasive? And we've advanced this idea of ultrasound guidance in surgery, sort of real-time pictures while we're operating. And people have used ultrasound for a very long time, but what are we doing differently? Well, the issue is that deep brain lesions, and I talked earlier about these spots that are in the basal ganglia, it's hard to get in there. And the nice thing about an ultrasound is that it's real time pictures. You, you can actually watch your fingers move and do stuff while you're operating, which is different than you may have heard about these sort of 3D navigation, heads up display, fighter pilot, fancy things. Those are awesome, but those are static. That means you take the picture, your Google Maps beforehand, and just like those TV shows where somebody follows the map right into the river because a road has changed since the map was taken, um, that's the danger in using that kind of technology. The brain can shift with movement, you position the child differently. And we've added this idea of ultrasound where we can be more accurate because we're getting real time pictures. And so what have we, you know, how do we do this? Again, some gross pictures coming up. So avert your eyes if you don't like them, but I think they're illustrative. Um, we basically, during the surgery, make a very tiny opening, smaller than we would normally make. And then with the ultrasound, we can take pictures of where the cavernoma is, if it's deep in some place we can't find it. We put in this very tiny little tube that will take us directly to it. And this is different than the way traditionally of sort of using the heads up display and kind of wondering where you are. You can then get to this cavernoma uh, very quickly uh, just by passing this catheter getting right in with a very small opening and then seeing where you are and taking it out very quickly. So again, we make this very tiny opening. This is about the size, less than a, a, a stick of uh, sort of dentine gum, really tiny. And um, we can get right to the lesion here and then take this out to this very narrow little track, which is much smaller than what people used to be able to do. So that's it for the gross pictures for a second. Um, what else can we do? So this saves time, uh, you know, saves stuff. Was there anything newer? And you say, Ed, we want something exciting. You've shown me surgery. You know, what else do you have? Well, lasers. Uh, and, you know, this is an example of even less invasive, where you may be able to put this very tiny fiber optic cable in through a little pinhole and um, zap cavernomas in very tight places. Now, to be clear, this still falls under the realm of somewhat experimental. And there are certainly some doctors that are very nervous about using lasers on blood vessel malformations, even slow flow ones like cavernomas. They would never use this on something like an aneurysm or a high pressure thing. Um, but 
it is something to consider if there are children that are very sick, that can't tolerate certain kinds of operations, if there are bleeding risks. And so this is an expanding area of surgical innovation where we are trying to get smaller, faster, less invasive with good results. And I suspect over the next few years, you'll start hearing more and more about the possibility of using lasers as part of uh, you know, one of the tools in the toolbox for surgery. Um, the last thing is, you know, how can we apply these surgical advances. So you've talked about, I've talked about different ways to get there. So we talk about, you know, what cavernomas are, how we get where we need to go and, you know, doing the surgery. But I think a big thing that has come up over the past few years is surgery needs to be taught. Um, you know, I, I, I often get asked, hey, Ed, you're the guy going to be doing the surgery, right? You're not going to have your, uh, you know, second year medical student come in after no sleep. And I, I try to treat all the kids like they're my own children. Um, but that said, you still, even for myself, some cases you want to rehearse, you want to get good at. How do you do that? Um, and so one thing we've done at Children's that I think we've been very good at pioneering, and now a lot of other institutions are starting to do the same thing, is this 3D patient printing. And unlike other models, which are just a generic head that looks like anybody else's head, we can take the actual scans of a specific patient, you know, uh, uh, Tommy McGee from South Boston or something, uh, it's a made up name, I'm HIPAA compliant, but, and then print his or her actual physical brain, skull, picture, everything, and rehearse the surgery beforehand and, and make this work. And I'm gonna show you a little example of this. Um, you know, we can print, print this with incredibly high fidelity that they can turn over in 24 hours. So if a patient's coming for surgery, they can send us their films from anywhere in the world and our team can print this up. Uh, we can practice the surgery, figure out the best approach, rehearse things and have this all done before the patient's plane even lands here in Logan in Boston. And so uh, this is sort of the rough idea where we hear somebody's coming, the um, team makes us some computer generated models to look at and say, well, what would we like for our rehearsal? And then they'll actually print these out in multiple different ways, uh, a, a brain to practice on that has the consistency of real tissue, uh, a skeleton model so we can see things in real three dimensions that you can't see on a computer screen, even with the hollow glasses or whatever they are. And, and I'm gonna show a little model of how we do this in real time. Uh, again, this is a video, so there may be a little bit of gross stuff. So again, avert your eyes, but I think it really highlights how this works. So if I make this go here, this is with a blood vessel malformation, but it's the same whether it's an AVM or cavernous malformation. This is what a scan looks like. You see a little dot, but they can print this model of a malformation here. You can make it regular size. You can make it twice as big so you know where the blood vessels are. You can do it inside the brain so you know where it is. Then at surgery, you're deep inside the brain like those pictures I showed you earlier. And yet what we can see is where these parts of the malformation are match exactly with where they are in the real operation. So by me seeing the model and rehearsing, I know that this blood vessel is this far away from that blood vessel and I have to work in between there. Looking just at the, at the actual operative field, I might have a tough time knowing that, but having re rehearsed it already, I, I've already done this several times. And the result is we can make the malformation go completely away and leave all the normal tissue behind. And so this has been a really great advance for us to, to sort of come into the 21st century, or I guess 22nd now, uh, with how to do this. Does it matter? Well, we, we weren't as fancy as being in the Atlantic, but we, we were treated, we were printed up in a, uh, a little nerd magazine, which is nice and wired. And what they showed is that our models are 98% uh, concordant, meaning the fidelity is very high. It really looks like, you know, it's like the two sides wax museum. They look very, very real for what is made. There's less than a two millimeter variation between the real world and the model. And what this translates to is a 12% reduction in operating room time. So you're, you're saving half an hour on general in the operating room for longer cases. And, and that means less time under anesthesia, safer surgery, better outcomes. You know, and it, it's a way that I think that it's not as cool and as interesting as some of the great scientists being done in the NGOM Alliance, but it's a way we're pushing the envelope forward and, and something that's you know, really practical for making things better. Um, the last thing for the talk here before I wrap up is a little bit about new ideas. And, and again, I do want to credit the Angioma Alliance. The, the real goal here is to put us surgeons out of, ther out, out of therapy. We're going to be in therapy, but put us out of business through new therapies. And, you know, um, I, I, I'm sure Connie and the team can speak to this much more eloquently than I can, but I am incredibly impressed with everything that's on the horizon 
uh, you know, I want to be clear, at least my understanding as a surgeon is there's no magic bullets right this second, you know, and I don't want to imply that you can go to the pharmacy, grab a couple of ibuprofen and an anti-cavernoma pill and have that with a cheeseburger and you're all set. But I'm really excited about what's coming down the road. These rho kinase inhibitors, those chemicals I talked about at the beginning that affect the stickiness and the movement of these blood vessel cells. Um, controlling inflammation, uh, the gut stuff we talked about with how that might modulate, if we can do it in a controlled way to minimize the risk of bleeding. Um, beta blockers are something people have been looking at, which are kind of old fashioned blood pressure medicine that may have some roles. Um, looking at the control of blood vessel growth. Uh, and then certainly, again, I, I don't want everyone to go out and start a new age fad diet in any special way, but I know Connie has her recommendations and I agree with them completely in terms of, you know, simple steps that can go to, uh, uh, you know, help to keep in balance the microbiome, the fancy term for, for, you know, gut bugs, but it sounds smarter if you say microbiome, that'll impress people at a party uh, and, and vitamin D3. So there's a lot of things I think that are really very, very exciting that each one alone might not be an absolute home run, but you put them all together and the sum are greater, uh, the sum of is greater than the whole of its parts, whatever the saying is. Uh, and there's going to be some home runs, I think, very soon on the horizon. Um, I do really want to credit uh, the Brain Vascular Malformation Consortium. Uh, this is a group that sort of uh, I've found seems to work hand in glove very nicely with the Angiom Alliance. And, and um, you know, the Angiom Alliance has been a, a real advocate for science. And, and uh, this has really helped quite a bit. Um, so what are my conclusions here? I was told to sort of keep it to about a half an hour or so. So I, I, it looks like I'm within about three minutes of being on time. So that's rare for me, but, but um, I really think that, you know, I don't need to tell this audience this, but cavernous malformation, cerebral cavernous malformations in the spine as well. It's a real significant healthcare burden. For, for families and the patients, right? Especially in kids. I mean, anybody's heart goes out for a kid in general, but there's also that much more at stake. I mean, quite candidly, as an old geezer myself, I, I think I'm important, but there's nobody more important than my kids and the kids I'm entrusted to care for. And when you have decades of life ahead of you, I think it's very imperative that, that you do everything humanly possible to do the right thing for the kids when they find they're when they're found to have a problem and, and you work as a team to get the best treatment. Um, improving outcomes for kids with cavernous malformations really, I think, mandates getting advances from multiple disciplines. It can't just be surgeons or benchtop scientists or epidemiologists. We have to innovate across multiple lines of study. Uh, and this is where I think, you know, groups like the Angiom Alliance, hearing from families, hearing from scientists in other parts of the world can really spark those ideas and stimulate novel thoughts that, that will push us forward in a way we can't. Um, I, I do think that stratifying risk with these population-based studies, getting big groups, getting outside of just one hospital and working across hospitals, which doctors don't really like to do, and that's where these groups can help do that, um, enable us to have these big, big studies that will help us figure out things like biomarkers, these abilities to sort of figure out who's at risk for bleeding, who's at risk for growing, who should get surgery, who shouldn't, who's the right candidate for a drug therapy, um, will really help to clarify the best treatment plan on a very individualized basis, you know, uh, for, for the absolute specific one person, how can we figure out who that is? Um, the takeaway is I think that children, and I'm very protective of the idea of taking care of kids and young adults, kids with cavernous malformations, they're, they're going to be the population that benefits the most, the absolute most from any novel approaches to treatment. What we do today maybe won't affect some of the grownups, but absolutely is going to impact the lives of the children that we see now for decades to come. So this is where we absolutely have to have, I think, our greatest focus on fixing things. And, and, and with the way we do this, our operative techniques, you know, doing stuff in the operating room, simulations to make surgery safer, molecular biology, to develop new treatments, and then unique methods of visualization, training, getting the next generation of scientists, surgeons, doctors, everybody uh, to, to really focus on the greatest asset we have, which is our children. 
So I, I'm really very grateful to have the chance to talk today. It's been a wonderful partnership, I think, between the NGOM Alliance, Boston Children's Harvard, and, and the whole community uh, as a whole. So uh, I hope this was helpful a little bit in sort of highlighting some of the unique aspects of kids, getting a little background on what cavernomas are, and shedding a little light on what we crazy surgeons do in the operating room and, and how we're trying to make things better for everybody that has a cavernoma. So I think that's all I have to share right now. Maybe I'll stop and uh, uh, Connie, if you want to act as the MC and walk me through questions or how to address stuff, I'm all ears. Absolutely. You have a ton of questions um, that people have been asking during the presentation. So um, I'm going to start with a COVID question. The question is, my daughter with sporadic CCM recently had COVID. She's fully vaccinated, fortunately had mild symptoms. Is there any reason to follow up with neuro teams after a child has been diagnosed with COVID and is through the COVID? Right. So number one, I'm glad that your, your, your child's doing better. So that's great. Um, obviously, we're learning right along with you, right? I mean, I can't pretend that, that we have, you know, 50 years of experience with this. Uh, what I can tell you is from my personal experience seeing patients here, um, with the exception of a few very rare cases of this so-called long COVID where, um, you know, people seem to have symptoms of particularly fatigue for a long, long time. Uh, I have not noticed, I, I would say I've only had maybe six or so, I'd have to look, but very few cases where there's been real problems with COVID. So the short answer is, with a lot of asterisks around it, I don't think there's anything special to worry about if she's recovered and is doing okay. Great. Okay. Um, next question. If there's a bleed, can it stop by itself? Absolutely. The short answer is yes. Uh, and that's what happens all the time. If it kept bleeding, it would get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so what happens is these little bubbles, like the picture I showed you, um, they will occasionally pop or leak and a little bit of fluid will come out. What happens is the fluid will keep coming out until the pressure on the outside equals the pressure on the inside. And then what will happen is the blood will stop moving. It won't keep going from low pre from high pressure to low pressure. When the blood stops moving and it touches all this weird stuff around the brain where it's not inside a blood vessel or a cavernoma, that stimulates the, the clotting cascade. Just like if you cut your shin, it leaks blood for a little while, but when the bleeding slows down, it will form a scab. And usually it will heal itself. And that's exactly what we think happens with cavernomas. It's just that because of the stickiness is not great, they're prone to bleed more than the normal non-cavernoma blood vessels that are there. So that'd be my answer to that is they absolutely stop themselves. Do you have, and this is one of the questions, it's one of my questions. Do you have recommendations to parents about pain treatment? Do they, do you suggest they not use NSAIDs or do you, or is that fine? Right. So, so the question about NSAID, so NSAID is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or uh, basically stuff you buy in, over the counter. So that can include basically three big kinds. Um, there's Tylenol, acetaminophen, and I have no problems with that. Um, but the other kinds, typically what are called like uh, ibuprofen or Aleve, uh, naproxen or, or uh, Motrin, um, those sometimes can thin the blood a little bit. Um, and, and that's the concern is you say, well, if you're taking these pain meds, can it thin the blood enough to cause a problem? Um, in general, I would say, do whatever your local doctor says. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not your doc, but I don't have any problem with using ibuprofen. Um, I think the bleeding risk for that is very low. We've had plenty of big operations we've done on people with lots of ibuprofen on board and, and they seem to be fine. The, the third class is aspirin, um, and aspirin is really super powerful at thinning blood. That's why people use it after heart attacks or if they've had strokes. I do have reservations about using aspirin, and there may be times where aspirin is the right thing to use if there's other risks, um, but um, the, the, you know, I, I don't like that. So short answer, Tylenol, no question, yes, fine. Ibuprofen, I say fine, but talk to your doctor. And uh, aspirin, I say no, and I suspect most of your doctors will say no, unless there's a very important overriding reason. So that's my qualified answer. Okay, next question. Um, do you typically recommend that kids get contrast with their follow-up MRIs? Right, so um, for those of you, again, contrast is when they put the IV in and they squirt and die. The advantage of contrast many times is that you can see blood vessels or swelling or leaking in the surrounding brain 
better than without it. That said, um, there are two downsides to contrast. So one is it takes more time, you get stuck in the arm, it hurts and it costs a little more. Um, so there's the sort of annoyance of it, cost time. The other is that there is a little bit of literature, especially in very, very young kids, infants, you know, a year old or younger, that multiple rounds of contrast can sort of affect brain development. Um, that's very minimal, but the short of it is, is that I don't think there's a lot of role for giving contrasts unless there's a specific question you're trying to ask. Because most of the time you can see the size of the cavernoma, you know if it's bled or not. Um, so I usually do not give contrasts unless there's a specific reason. Oh, you're still quiet there, Connie. I'm sorry. Oh, do you want me to look in the, I can look in the chat and try to answer them. You've got, you've got no, you're getting some headphones. We're playing, we're playing mimes. Uh, second word, first syllable. I got it. You're going to get headphones. Okay. While you're getting headphones, I will try to look in the chat and I will pretend that I not quite a, as smart as Connie here with this, but let's see. Um, what is the, um, uh, let's see, uh, what is the criteria for surgery? So I think I answered that, but basically, um, if the, uh, lesion is growing, if it's bleeding repeatedly, if it's causing symptoms, and if it's not in a place where the risk is so high, like the middle of the brainstem, that is usually the, the reason to do surgery. Um, so again, this often involves a lot of discussion with your local doc, but most of the time, if it is enlarging on serial images, if it is causing symptoms that match with the location. So for example, if you had a, a cavernoma that was in the vision center and you had weakness of your hand, you wouldn't operate on that necessarily. Uh, but if it was in the vision center and you had worsening vision problems, that would be a reason. Um, so enlargement over time, that was significant. And that's a subjective term, repeated bleeding in a short window of time, usually over months to a year or so, uh, or evidence of symptoms that match to the location that are likely to be removed. And that can include seizures. So that'd be my answer to that. Uh, so Connie, are you back online? I am back online. Sorry about that. So the, the answer is that my AirPods were downstairs and the cat somehow managed to open them and they connected to the computer. Anyway, I'm back. Um, the next question is, is um, deep catheter ultrasound surgery only being done at Boston Children's or are there other places that you can get that? Oh, I mean, that, that's uh, a lot of people can do it. Uh, you know, like I said, this is a technology that's around a lot. It's just how we repurposed it, uh, which I think is, is helpful. Um, it, it is probably something a little rarer in kids um, simply because not a lot of kids hospitals use the ultrasound for cavernomas in this way, but you know, you can ask anybody to do it. And if they want to fall asleep, they can read our paper. It's not, it's not too hard. It's not brain surgery. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm sure other people are using it. Uh, we just, we use it pretty routinely here and it works great. Okay. Um, is there anything new on spinal surgery in kids for cavernous malformations? Yeah, so uh, there are a number of things that have been really exciting about that. Um, so one is it sounds silly, uh, but there is a device called a bone scalpel, which is an ultrasonic scalpel for um, uh, cutting bone and, and it makes these very, very fine cuts. And you say, well, why does that matter? Well, the reason is that for little kids, one of the biggest problems for accessing the spine to get to where the cavernoma is, uh, is the concern that by removing the bone, it can impair their growth and they can get scoliosis or a bend in the back or they might need a spinal fusion. By using some of these technologies to um, minimize the amount of bone that comes out and put them back together in a, in a less traumatic way, you really reduce the side effects of getting there. There's also some very advanced neural monitoring. And this is something I think that has really been a game changer um, for pediatrics where to get the very tiny neural monitoring tools that can get into the spine um, has been immensely helpful. So I use them for spinal cord tumors. I also use them for cavernomas. Um, and it is, it is 
wonderful because what they can do is they can tell us if we're if what area we can use to go into the spinal cord safely where is our greatest route by live real time we sort of have a nasa mission control and so the combination of reducing side effects through the um the bone scalpel the intraoperative ultrasound which now has these smaller heads specific to kids which is very unique and really the neural monitoring um, it, it has uh, really helped a lot. It's still a risky place to work. And um, this is something too, where you really want a good neuroanesthesia team. It's not as much as us surgeons have fat heads and thinks we're hot stuff. Um, the reason sometimes we're fortunate to look good is because we've got neuroanesthesiologists that do spinal vascular disease every week. So um, that's immensely important as well. Far more, or not far more, but at least as much as what we do for surgeons. So those are some advances. Okay. Is it possible for seizures to stop over time if the cavernous malformation is stable and doesn't change? Yeah, I, I would defer to our smart neurology colleagues on this, but um, certainly we've had a number of patients anecdotally that, um, you know, presumably something flared up when the cavernoma bled at some point in the past or grew a little bit. Uh, it stimulated a little irritation. And then with time, whether it's because they've been treated with anti-seizure medicines and quieted things down, or whether the cavernoma has stopped acting up. Uh, we have certainly had people have had long-term stability on their um, seizures, even off medication. Um, that said, you know, this is something where you very much want to have a neurologist involved. You don't want to be making these decisions on your own. And you certainly, as a neurosurgeon, I always get the neurology folks uh, as part of the team because they're going to give you a much smarter answer than, than certainly I could. Um, can you talk a little bit about gamma, gamma knife and whether it's appropriate for our kids? Right. So the first thing I like to tell people all the time, uh, gamma knife is the absolute best advertisers in the world because gamma knife is just a brand name like Coca-Cola or Pepsi for a, uh, a machine that is, that is brand oriented. Really what it is, is um, it's radiation. And I'm going to go a little in the weeds again, like with my slide, but there's protons and photons. Photons, and they are physically different things, stuff like that. The gamma knife is just uh, radiated in a specific shape. Um, there are many different companies and, and now with, with better computers, things like Linac are just as good as Gamma Knife. And the reason I'm drawing this out is because I don't want people to feel like they have to travel someplace just for Gamma Knife if you have Linac or something else around. Protons are much tighter, they're narrower. Uh, so if you have something that's in a really dangerous place like the brainstem or the eye nerves, sometimes protons can be more specific that photons or Gamma Knife can't. That said, there are very rare cases if you have a multiply bleeding, very tiny, deep cavernous malformation that can't be reached by surgery where we have used radiation. Um, but by and large, we really, really try not to use radiation at all uh, because number one, most of the time, if it's that bad, you can get to it with surgery uh, that justifies the surgery. And the cure rates and the side effects, you know, the cure rates are somewhat low and the side effects can be somewhat high, especially in kids with exposure to radiation. So I never want to say never and talk to your local team, but we as an institution, including our radiation folks, have a pretty strong bias against radiation treatment for cavernomas in kids. So big qualified no with a lot of asterisks, I guess I would say. Um, I am supposed to please share with Dr. Smith that he is such a gem to this group and we are so grateful for his knowledge and partnership with our group. And mom, I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know my mom was on the cavernoma talk tonight. She's, uh, <laughs> mom and dad are watching from Dartmouth, Mass. Hiya, mom and dad. <laughs> well, thank you, I'm, I'm blushing now. Okay. Um, next question from the same person. So I think that that's the setup that you need to answer this one well. Do you recommend vitamin D for your pediatric patients? Uh, so this comes up quite a bit and, uh, you know, I'd be interested to hear the, the, the line from the Angioma Alliance as well. I, I certainly agree that if their vitamin D levels are low, absolutely. You know, and, and what I almost always do in this situation is I punt and I will say, I'm in favor of it. If it's helpful, you can go talk to your pediatrician. They can go over the pros and cons of vitamin D supplementation in kids. Um, 
I think a little extra vitamin D is not bad, but my big fear is that somebody goes home, buys a jug of vitamin D, chugs it down, drinks milk, and the body can only absorb so much. And, and once you get too much in there, it can be, you know, sort of a fat soluble vitamin, it can be a problem. So um, short answer, I'm fine with it as long as it's done with smart people, meaning not surgeons, uh, being weighing in on the appropriate dosing. And especially as the child ages, gains or loses weight, um, it's much different than an adult where you can just be a little more cavalier about dosing. So a very qualified yes with some really important caveats. And Connie, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all from the group, but. Um... Yeah, so, so what I, every physician who comes on here and does a webinar gets asked that question. Everyone has a different answer. So right. just so you know, it, right. there is no right answer to this. And I, I think what, what I have said to, um, to adult patients is get your vitamin D levels checked um, and then you know, let your doctor help you figure out how much you need to supplement, if any. Um, I, I don't know that there are actually standard levels for kids though. So that, that would be my one question. And that's just my own ignorance. Right. And, and, and so this comes up a lot with our groups here and the endocrinologists seem to be very, very different than the general pediatrician group. Uh, and, and there tends to be a little bit of a fight. Uh, so uh, I, I'm not going to wade into that too much, uh, but I will say if you want a definitive answer, it will probably involve speaking to at least two endocrinologists. Uh, I usually just, as Connie said, just say, start with your pediatrician, um, see what they have to say and take it from there. Uh, I don't object to having it, but usually regular dietary levels, if you get your hundred percent a day, is going to be more than enough for a kid to have, you know, pretty much all and more than what they need. And throw them outside every once in a while. You want to get yeah. them out of the anyway. Yeah. Move, move from Minnesota down to, uh, you know, the Sun Belt, I guess. Uh, yeah. Minnesota is lovely. Nothing against any Minnesotans in the crowd, uh, you know, but college roommate from Minnesota. But, uh, anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, here's an interesting question. Have you ever noticed that there's any um, correlation of the location of lesions across generations? So if, if an adult has a lesion that's cerebellar or frontal or whatever, does their child in the familial form tend to have one in the same place? You know, I never thought of that. You win the prize of that's the first time I've been asked that. It, <clears throat> if you look just last month on the Boston Children's webpage, they did a little, um, uh, one of these patient stories about an absolutely lovely family we had where the dad had a cavernoma treated by Mike Scott decades ago. And the daughter had a bleeding cavernoma that I just operated on a few months ago. I'll have to look at the pictures, but I, now that you say it, I wonder if it was in the same spot. That is really interesting. Um, I don't know, uh, you, you stumped me. I'll, I'll have to take a look, but that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, I'm going to table that. So I love I, it. I'll look it up, get you back in the next webinar. Okay. Um, so the, the question is in, in periods of time when the brain is growing, and I'm assuming this is early in development, can that be a time that has more hemorrhage than once the brain size is more stable? Can the brain growth yeah, so as you know, there's been a number of different folks that have talked about this for um, relative risk of bleeding at different age points in life. And we usually get into a lot of arguments in our groups uh, led by very little science. Um, but I will say that um, I'll, I'll, I'll call it anecdotally, there are a few very tiny case studies that have been brought up at the ASPN, the American Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery, um, that uh, very, very young kids, so in the first one to two years of life, there anecdotally seems to be a little higher rate of bleeding. And then the second cohort we tend to see are pre-teens into teen years, so early puberty. So for girls, it's a few years earlier than boys, so sort of nine to 13 or so. And for boys, again, lagging by about two or three years. Um, the reason we've posited this are either hormonal changes, which are a general hand-waving bunch of stuff. Um, I do think when you look at this, um, there are substantial changes in the blood pressure of a teen compared to a preteen. 
right? So an adult blood pressure is 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury, meaning, you know, it's about this high. Uh, and a child, elementary school kid, might be 80 over 60, you know, two thirds of that or less. Um, and that ramping up is, is fairly short over a couple of years as kids go through their growth spurt. And for those of you that have teenage kids, I think, you know, you got to throw the shoes out, it seems like every night and get a new pair as the kids grow. Um, there is some compelling data in the Moya Moya world, which is another blood vessel disease um, and growing evidence in the AVM world that these blood pressure shifts may be causative or at least related to uh, onset of bleeding or stroke in these other groups. So that's gonna be my working hypothesis that very, very young kids because of shift in, in growth and teen to preteen kids, but I don't know that I'm aware of any hard data that supports that necessarily. I don't know, Connie, if you know of anything else, but, but that's, uh, that's the best answer we have from our groups neurosurgically. Yeah, I, and but the the description of when the bleeds happen is exactly what I understand. I just don't have an explanation either. Yeah. All right, um, could I'm I'm gonna have to skip a few questions, folks who put questions in because we're gonna be running short on time. So I'm trying to hit the highlights. Could you speak about yeah. operating in eloquent areas like preoperative functional MRIs, cortical mapping, bipolar electrode stimulation? Thank you. Yeah. So again, for you're asking a very, uh, every eloquent question, but for those in the group that aren't familiar with it, eloquent brain just means brain that does stuff um, and, and functional brain tissue, meaning there are chunks of the brain in the front of the brain, for example, that, that probably have no known function evolutionarily. We, we don't know what they do. They don't do much, but the point is you can remove big pieces of them and people are fine, or at least they're like orthopedic surgeons. Uh, well, it's a little slight on orthopedic surgeons, uh, but, um, there are other parts of the brain that have very important functions. So the speech center of the brain, the vision center of the brain, the movement parts of the brain. And the question is, if you have a cavernous malformation in those areas, on the one hand, they're much more common to cause problems because they're in a they're in a bad spot. So you want to get rid of them. On the other hand, the stakes are a lot higher because if they're in those high risk areas, how the heck do you get them out? And so there are a couple of tools that we use. You know, in the old days, there was functional MRI, which means that you get a regular MRI, but during the MRI, they ask the patient to do stuff, wiggle your fingers, look at stuff, read a book, and parts of the brain will light up. Um, a real big advance, I think, which is much better that we have now at Children's that a number of centers are starting to use is transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, it's a big mouthful, but basically the idea is that you use fancy magnets during the testing of different parts of the brain to identify function within the brain. Why is that important? Well, because in MRIs, you're looking at blood flow as sort of a surrogate marker for function. So you're saying, well, if this part of the brain, when you ask them to read, demands more blood, probably that's the, the, the talking part. But it may get more blood if you're nervous, it may get more blood if your blood pressure is different, it may be unrelated. In contrast, this transcranial magnetic stimulation, what that does is it actually sees electrical activity of the brain as measured by magnets, and it can show you which parts are doing what function. And this has been immensely helpful for our preoperative mapping. It takes a little time to get it scheduled, uh, but if you're in an eloquent area, that's great. Um, there are the usual adjuncts in surgery where during surgery, if you have an older child, you can have them be awake. And during the surgery, you can ask them to do stuff. It's really hard in young kids. So we almost never do that because the kids kind of freak out as, as I would. Um, uh, but we do have the, the tools I mentioned with the 3D imaging, the neuro navigation, the minimally invasive ports and potentially the laser, all of which add. So in short, two big things. One is we have much better tools before surgery to understand where the eloquent areas are. So we have a roadmap as to how to get there more safely than if we were flying blind. And that's a huge advance with some of the tools we have now in imaging. The second is even if we've got a better roadmap, we now have a better car to drive there with some of the tools I showed you in our talk today with the minimally invasive catheter ultrasound based approach, um, the neuro navigation, um, the possibly laser. So I think we've got a lot of ways to attack bad lesions in eloquent areas that we didn't have even four or five years ago. Okay. Can you talk about removing cavernomas when there is a DVA present. 
Yeah, so again, a DVA is this thing called a developmental venous anomaly. It is a normal vein in an abnormal area. And these are very commonly associated with cavernomas. In fact, if you see a DVA, sometimes that forces us to look for a cavernoma. And we think what they are is the cavernoma are little capillaries, the sort of middle blood vessels, and the DVA are the veins that seem to be draining the blood out of the cavernoma. So the reason that's important is that a DVA, in addition to draining the cavernoma, might also be draining blood from healthy brain nearby. And the worry is if at surgery you inadvertently damage the DVA and, and cauterize it and close it off, that's fine if you're taking out the cavernoma, but if the normal brain can't drain its blood the way that it should, the brain can get congested and swollen and seize and bleed and do all kinds of yucky stuff. Um, what I have found over the years is um, many times you can take the cavernoma out without damaging the DVA. Uh, and sometimes that requires a little bit of planning and looking at things. This is one of the times where you may want contrast in an MRI to understand what that looks like. Um, but honestly, as long as you do a very careful resection where you really hug, meaning you stay close to the cavernoma and you, you only sort of like a, like a bomb diffusing, you just disconnect the, the veins that are coming out of the cavernoma as opposed to the whole DVA, I've always, knock on wood, been, been very lucky in that that has not been a big problem. So we do try to preserve them, but with some caveats, you can take parts of them usually and it's fine. Okay. And do you know if the DVAs increase the risk of bleeding? So uh, it, it, that's like the equivalent of saying, uh, I don't know what, you know, it, it, is the world flat or something like that? I mean, um, there, there's a whole literature, even without cavernomas, about the risk of bleeding and DVAs. And um, the short answer is, is that it probably does not increase the risk of bleeding, but there is a risk with larger vein structures of them clotting um, because of the abnormal flow in them. So if you get sick, if you get the flu, if you get dehydrated, if you, uh, you know, have a sort of a clotting problem in your body and you've got these funny veins that are more prone to clotting anyway, then the idea is that that clotting problem, temporary or not, might gum up some of those draining veins. And just like I talked about before, blood can't exit and you can bleed. So there's probably an infinitesimally higher risk with DVAs in general, but it's certainly nothing to worry about. And I would the dictum in neurosurgery is you do not remove a DVA if you find it. So if you say, well, hey doc, if there's some increased risk of bleeding, should we take out the DVA? The answer is, Heck no. Uh, so that's my answer to that. Okay. I'll take just one or two more questions depending on the how long the answers go. So um, sometimes people have seizures even when there's been no recent bleeding. Can you um, talk, speak to that, why that might be happening? And also there was a question about if you remove the carinoma from an eloquent area and leave the hemosiderin ring behind, which is sort of a related question, can you still um, cure the seizures? Right, so uh, there's a reason I showed that picture at the beginning that had that hemosiderin. So to remember that's the rust or the tattoo, the stain around the cavernoma that's bled. And so the two questions are, if you take out the cavernoma or why, did, why do these things still bleed even if, why do these things still cause seizures even if they don't bleed? And the answer is probably a combination of maybe a little bit of the hemosiderin um, sitting around and irritating the brain, or it's just like a pebble in your shoe, the physical cavernoma is sort of exerting some degree of pressure on the brain. If it had enlarged to some state, even if it's not actively bleeding, they can still grow or inflate a little bit. So they enlarge without bleeding. That's one way they can cause seizures. Um, the other way is that the brain around it, whether or not there's hemosiderin, if it's been irritated in the past, you can have this phenomenon called kindling. And I mentioned that earlier in the talk. This is where the nerve cells around there are so irritated by having stuff, they just fire sporadically. And this creates sort of a snowball effect uh, where once some parts of the brain are already kindling, they irritate the surrounding brain and it creates this sort of loop where they keep firing off each other, even if the cavernoma isn't changing. Um, and so that's why you can still have seizures even if it's not actively bleeding. Similarly, if you take the cavernoma out, one of the benefits um, is that 
you presumably reduce that irritation. If the brain was squished before, and now you unsquish it by taking out the cavernoma, healthy blood can feed that kindled, irritated brain. And it says, oh, I'm, I'm oxygenated, I'm fed, I'm happy, I'm just gonna relax. And the seizures can stop. Um, because of that, while we generally like to take the hemosiderin out, if it's in a part of the brain that affords it, and it's a, a non-eloquent part of the brain, we found that the seizure uh, reduction rate is essentially equal whether or not you take out the hemosiderin. The real big thing seems to be removing that irritant, taking the pebble out of your shoe. Um, so um, bottom line is we don't really take the hemosiderin, especially if it's in a eloquent area. Sometimes you gotta come back for another seizure surgery, but if it's you know sort of in the 90-ish percent rate of, of fixing things, uh, we try not to injure the surrounding brain if we can help it. Thank you. Um, I think the rest of the questions, most of them are questions that are that we can answer. Um, at some other time, probably most of them I can answer. Um, so I wanna thank you. This has been wonderful. And I want to encourage our audience to go in the chat and click on the link to the support group that's happening tonight. Um, it, once you click on it, you should just be moved right into a different Zoom and to have a little bit more conversation between each other about what you heard tonight. So. Thank you, Dr. Smith. It's always a pleasure to talk with you and we'll be talking again soon, I think. Great. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure. And if ever if folks have other questions that haven't answered, give me a call or an email anytime. And I want to congratulate again, Connie, for uh, great stuff in general and the recent Atlantic article as well. So thanks so much and hopefully see you again sometime soon. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.